Well, the drama never ends. The never ending story. What is this? Part 11, Ben? I think. I think it's part 11. I've lost 11, count. 12. Part, I mean, sod knows, right? We went into, we're getting to, we're into the spheres of numbers where there's literally no word for it. And I don't really think there's a word to try and summarize and explain kind of what's happened over the last 12 to 24 hours. How are we doing, everyone? Welcome to United People's TV. This is me and Ben. We've been speaking since, well, I think we were there right at the start, weren't we, Ben? We're, this is part 12 of it now. And I don't think, maybe maybe we did see something like this coming. Uh, to summarise everybody for everybody, what's happened in these last 20, 24, 12 hours, really. Uh, there was a newspaper from Qatar, Al-Watan, who reported that the Sheikh Jassim bid had been successful and that an announcement was going to come. It caused a frenzy. It was like a fit, you know, like when you drop a fish into like a pool of shark, it just goes, blah, 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 and just, just goes crazy. That's that's ba basically what happened. It went wild, wildfire, and the markets reacted. And it was the market reaction which piqued my interest because it spiked to around about twenty percent after hours, and that's not when the public are trading on it. Ben, we're going to speak about what happened there, what's happened since, what you've been told from the Qatari side of things. But as always, thank you very much for your time. Absolute pleasure. And for those of you that don't want to listen to me ramble on for half an hour, I would just say, calm down, everybody. Wait, <laughs> don't jump the gun. That's pretty much a summary of what we're going to delve into. That's, that's pretty much that's pretty much a summary of what happened last night. When, when the story first broke, right, I, I sat there for 20 minutes, half an hour. I was like, do I cover this? Because it doesn't feel massively tangible. At the time, straight away, I said, it just it's odd that it's they would tweet about it, but you wouldn't put it on your website. You wouldn't put it in the sports section of the Al Watan newspaper. Uh, and as it's transpired now, it's come out. Well, lo and behold, uh, the editor of, of Al Watan said, "No, this wasn't based on any sort of inside information. This is kind of we were covering what was being said elsewhere. It's kind of like it wasn't our fault. Look over there." But the market reaction was was wild. And if I'm looking now at the stop at uh, the share price now that the market's opened, it's it's not crashed. It's still sitting around the $22 mark, which is around about 10% up on what it was yesterday. So there's still a little bit of an inflation from what it was previous, prior to this. But Ben, uh, you're someone who's been involved in this process from the very start. Um, what is it that, you're, that you've been hearing in reaction to this news from the Qatari side of things? Well, I think the first thing to say is that, as has now been clarified by the editor of the Al Watan newspaper, they were not breaking a story, they were aggregating. And maybe something was lost in translation, but if you look at what they actually wrote, they make it quite clear, it's press reports. So every outlet when summarizing press reports would usually try and check and confirm, but there's an element of gossip too, and lots of outlets yeah. do that. They run a gossip section, they say what other people are reporting, and it felt like aggregation. And for those that feel like that paper would have credence and inside information, all I would say is, if that is correct, you run the story yourself. You run it as an exclusive. You put it on the back page. And I can guarantee you that every major Qatar outlet, if the 9-2 Foundation win the race for Manchester United, will be shouting and screaming about it on their front pages, on their back pages, and on social media. This was buried in a social media graphic and then it exploded. And one of the problems is that then everyone sees that plus stock market and then they start to look at other media outlets that are aggregating it with slightly clickbaity headlines as well. Like Sheikh Jassim yeah. has won. The mirror, the mirror done that straight Manchester away. United. And you see it everywhere. You see it in the British media. You see it in the European media. You see it in the Arabic speaking media. And suddenly you lose where the source has come from. And this was pure aggregation. So I don't mean to sound negative. I'm not pouring cold water over anything. I'm just pointing out that there's two primary groups in this race looking for either control or an outright sale, plus the minority investors. And at this stage, nobody's been informed of anything at the time we're recording this. And I'm being told that in the next few days, that may not change. And we can delve into why and what exactly is happening throughout the course of this recording. But yep. it's such a seminal moment. It's such a vital time for Manchester United. It's going to be one of the biggest announcements ever in sport, certainly in terms of transactions. But I would argue that the sale of Manchester United, if that's what happens for a world record price, 
is also up there with Messi moving to Inter Miami or Kylian Mbappe when he joined PSG and now he might be leaving PSG. It is massive, not just in Speaking football, both of them. not just in sport, but in business. It's front and back page news. And as a journalist, therefore, to say anything on the matter in terms of who has won, you have to be 100% sure. It's not about being first. It's about being right. And anyone under the sun, whether they're Joe1234 or whether they are an outlet, can say anything, can guess at anything. And in essence, you've got a 25% chance of being right because there's four options. There's Jasim, there's Ineos, there's minority investment or financing, or there's no sale. And some would say it's a 50% chance because at the moment, the priority is to deal with the two bids for either a full sale or control and resolve that situation. And obviously, if the Glazers don't go with either, then they've got other options. So ben, anyone can ben, make a guess. Ben, you've got a good you, chance of being right, but you've got to be accurate. Do, do you remember the conversations we had like back at the start? We were like, oh, like, it feels like at this point, uh, after we go past uh, to find out whether it's going to be going down the full sale, we'll, we'll kind of know the Glazers' hand. We'll... we'll We'll know a little mm. bit more about what their what their real intentions are, and we, we still we, we we still don't really know what their true intentions are. It, it's it's incredible that they've managed to go this deep into the process, mm. and they still haven't shown their hand. Um, I have to admire the shithousery, I suppose, of it. Uh, but it's um it, it's created this atmosphere where something like last night could exist, where United fans are we're all desperate. As, as a fan base, to find out what's happening with our football club. And for a lot of United fans, um, the Qataris are the outright favourite choice. That's who they want to be. So they so this got jumped on. And I didn't think that, that simple aggregators could cause a market reaction of that scale. Um, but maybe it did. Because I think we've spoken about it before. I've spoken about it on the channel. Um, when the... When Mike Keegan first came out about the Qatari um, full takeover, because prior to that, it was just about minority investment and QSI. And that's where the conversation, we were having those conversations, QSI, QIA. We didn't know anything about that. When that price came out, the, the, the big came out, the price spiked about 18%. It dipped around about 13% when reports came out around um, the Glazers maybe staying in. And then they spiked to get, it's, it's, it seems like the grandest example of that. Uh, and boy, it's uh, it's just I think United fans are just kind of getting played with, I suppose, and kind of have been with this whole process to an extent. But remember, this is a business transaction, and the Glazers can be faulted for almost everything at Manchester United in terms of abandoning the club, foundational core elements that are rotten, a lack of modernization, all kinds of things have been leveled at the Glazers by large parts of the fan base. And as a journalist, I've got empathy for certain aspects and accusations made against them. One is that they've not been transparent and open and spoken. One is they've not modernized the football club. Ultimately, it's in debt. And all of these things are bad for sustainability. But one thing you can't really criticize the Glazers for is just trying to get the highest possible price. It's their process. And people might be frustrated by it. And obviously that includes those senior within the football club, but they're trying to get the best possible price. This is still ultimately all about money. And the reason why they haven't shown their hand, as I reported a few days back, is because the determination has been made to treat all groups like a preferred bidder and have them jump through virtually every preferred bidder step, due diligence, final negotiations, independent valuations, all kinds of things that would normally only happen with a preferred bidder. And that preferred bidder would traditionally be one group in an exclusive period. So we have to be very clear because throughout this whole process, we've said preferred bidder. And the reason why we said preferred bidder is because Rain ran the Chelsea sale and they shortlisted effectively four preferred groups and then they picked one. And it had to happen very fast. So when there were four preferred groups, a lot of due diligence was done, even though no one was exclusive at that point. So if earlier in the process there was a preferred bidder, then they would enter into exclusivity, they would do their due diligence, and that was the expectation. But there's been such a low volume of credible suitors 
that are prepared to get anywhere close to the Glazers' valuation, that we've actually hit a scenario where everybody has kind of stayed in the race and everybody is effectively not waiting to be preferred bidder. And maybe that term will actually end up getting used by some, but it's a bit of a media construct at this point because we're not talking about a preferred bidder now. We're talking about a winner and we're not talking about exclusivity. We're talking about the completion process. And in that completion process, it's very much about signing and being bound on both sides. And then after signature, there would be a massive break clause if either party was to exit. Whereas traditionally, preferred bidder and exclusivity is about due diligence and is about final negotiations. And we're almost beyond that stage because Sheikh Jassim said that that group are not going to engage further on financials. And Jim Ratcliffe hasn't increased his offer. They're simply talking about the structure of the deal. So we have to be very careful at this point because I think everyone's waiting for a preferred bidder stage. But my understanding is that exclusivity will not be offered in a preferred bidder stage to either group. So instead, what's happening, which is way more advanced, is that they're both being put on the brink. They're both being told complete the deal. And I use this analogy over the course of the last few days, and I think it's the simplest way of explaining it. Imagine you've got two people that want to buy a house. And effectively, the broker doing that deal says... Both of your offers need to be in shape to sign. Both of your offers need to have all the paperwork ready. Both of your offers need to be watertight and executionable. And then one day after discussion internally and at board level, we're going to say, this is the one that we want to sign. And even though the other one's ready to sign and ready to execute and ready to transfer the funds, the house isn't yours. And that's almost the situation that we're in. Now, I'm being a little bit superficial. It's far more complex, obviously, than yeah. the exact analogy I've given. So both groups are cautiously optimistic, if you like, or a growing positivity on the Qatar side and a consistent cautious optimism on the Ratcliffe side. Because they're both being asked to do these really in-depth, advanced aspects. And then the Glazers will eventually communicate if either of them are going to be successful. And the last thing, Sam, I just want to add really yeah, quick right. is that you said the Glazers haven't really shown their hand. I think the growing positivity on the Qatar side is just they kind of did a little bit because everyone got too focused with Nasser Al-Khalifi being a consultant. And there were headlines and stories around that part because... Maybe it calls into question whether Sheikh Jassim is actually pulling the strings and whether he is actually only, as is claimed, a private investor. And that's fine. And we have to give that scrutiny as journalists. But as I've reported since February, Nasser Al-Khalifi was always a consultant when asked. It doesn't mean he's pulling the strings. And he said that on record. And again, we have to give those comments scrutiny rather than just swallow them. But that is what he said on record. Yeah. But more telling and significant is the bit that's gone under the radar, which is the Glazers instigated the contact with Al Khalifi. So why are they instigating any contact with a group that wants to buy all of their shares unless they remain determined sellers? And that's highly significant. That's not to say that Ratcliffe won't win because he's flexible and he will also either buy all 69% of their shares or give two of them, Joel and Avram, an opportunity to stay. And this is why everything is still very unclear at this stage. But when we're looking for whether or not the Glazers will genuinely all sell, I think we can say yes for the right price. So it is still all about money. Otherwise, what were they doing uh, approaching Khalifi in the first place? If two of them desperately wanted to stay and they want to surrender control at the same time, they've got one option and that's Sir Jim Ratcliffe. So then why not just take that deal? Why not just progress with that deal? Why not just kick Qatar out of the race? So I think that they've shown their hand a little bit, but you're absolutely right in what you say. We thought they would have to show their full hand far earlier and they yeah. haven't. And that's the most frustrating part of the entire process. And I don't even think they've fully shown their hand to the groups either. No, I, I don't even think they've fully shown their hands to each other. Uh, I don't even think all six siblings of the Glazers know exactly what everybody wants to do. I reckon there's still some internal smoke and mirrors going on. But it's um, from your experience of dealing with, I suppose, it, maybe the, the Chelsea example is not a very good one when it comes to a sale mm. takeover and saying, oh, like, that should be compared to Manchester United. But what do, you, what do you think that we should be expecting from this point? Uh, so I like... For example, the reports last week were correct. By the end of this week, we get to know who the new owner is going to be. I think I agree with you. I don't think that's going to necessarily be a preferred bidder. And we, and we go back to the start of, a, of an exclusivity period. Like It feels like we've done that publicly at the same time. 
So how how long do you think that United fans can reasonably expect to wait for the next? Because we are just waiting for the step here. This isn't going to be the takeover done. This is just going to be, you know, well, you don't know. Be. You don't know. I mean, this is the point. If things are really advanced, then the next step logically could be a winner. Now, winner doesn't mean completion. So this is the area that has, I think, the least amount of information from sources. Because if you outline the process for completion, which is not just about winning or signing, yeah. it's about passing a Premier League owners and directors test. It's transferring the funds, which usually comes last. And any other box ticks, legal or formality-wise, everything like that could take three to six weeks. So the key question is how much of that has already been done and prepared versus how much will be done as or when anything is fully agreed with the Glazers. And I think that that's quite difficult to predict because, for example, this process is about 69% of the shares. But for Jassim, he'll have to proceed to 100% and delist the public shares as a consequence. And that can't be done until ultimately the Glazers give a green light. So it may actually take slightly longer in terms of weeks for the 9-2 Foundation to get the keys to the club compared to Sir Jim Ratcliffe because he's not ultimately taking the public shares. So there's a slightly different process for completion here. But I think the next step is effectively winner. Now, some, because it's kind of a media construct, may speak about preferred bidder. But mm. again, preferred bidder in a standard takeover means exclusivity. That's really all it means. And exclusivity is for due diligence and final negotiations. I think that if there's any exclusivity that comes in this process, it will simply be to ensure that the funds are transferred and that all of the protocol around completion is done. It won't really be a period for negotiation, which is what we tend to associate with a preferred bidder. So I'm a bit against the grain here, I know, because there's been very strong reports from journalists I respect that have said a preferred bidder will be named this week and yeah. have hinted that that will entail exclusivity. My understanding is, as I reported a few days ago, that effectively Ratcliffe and Jassim are working through steps traditionally associated with a preferred bidder and have been now for quite some time or certainly a matter of weeks and that there'll be no real need to put them at this point into exclusivity. Rain Group will not be offering exclusivity at this point. That's my understanding as I exclusively revealed towards the beginning yeah. of the week. Now, that's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean that we won't get any clarity, but what it means is the next clarity will be more significant than only a preferred bidder. It will effectively be a winner and then steps for some kind of acquisition. If the Glazers go down that line, we have to point yeah. out that there's minority investors and there's no sale and uh, we still cannot discount any possibility. Feels unlikely Why? at this point, though. Feels unlikely at this well, point. Well, you say that, but again, for balance, we have to point out that Oh, of course, Carlisle you can't rule it out. Turned away, the oak tree haven't been turned away. The Aries haven't been turned away. So some of this is the game to put pressure, obviously, on the main two contenders. But it would be irresponsible to just say that it's only a two-horse race. And I think that specifically timeline-wise, I, I would also be very cautious about this week, to be perfectly honest with you. I think the indications from those close to both the groups and also the selling side is that nothing public and groundbreaking may materialize in the next 48 hours and maybe not even this week, even though, as I say, at the beginning of the week, there were these strong indications that we'll get something this week. So if the reason ben, if, why if, I say if I, that... If I could sort of interrupt you there, just because I want to... I'm not trying to put words in your mouth when I'm asking this question. I'm saying... From your perspective now as a journalist is sort of like you've been in the process and you've been reporting on the process since the very beginning. At this point and this stage and where we are now with the fifth bid in from Sheikh Jassim, with the conversations that have been had with Nasser Al-Khalifa, with everything that's happened now, what could possibly be a reason that the Glazers delay this any further? Like, well, again, I don't what, what... think that we're talking about delays. So we have to be really careful how we phrase things because as yeah. I said probably in the first show that we did, a standard takeover takes nine months. We're about seven and a half months into this one, and we're far less if you take the point when indicative offers came in. So 
I'm sure that those close to Rain Group would argue that the process time-wise, even though there's, of course, been twists and competing narratives, it hasn't taken as long as Manchester United fans feel. But because it's been so public, the frustration is there. And because everyone mm -hmm. wants to get in, certainly Ratcliffe and um, Jassim, before the window opens. And the window is about to open. And I doubt that we'll have clarity when the window opens. So I wouldn't necessarily term it a delay at this point because we have to understand what's going on behind the scenes. People might be pleasantly surprised, and this is what I mean about this week, that if it was just a preferred bidder named and they did enter into a period of exclusivity and they did do a bunch of due diligence and there were further negotiations and there was questions and there was a final price and then there was a signature and then there was a completion process, people might feel, great, we know where we stand and that's absolutely fine. And I understand that every little bit of clarity, especially if it's formal, is hugely reassuring to the Manchester United fan base. But that would still then all take time. Whereas if we get a winner, if it turns out that things are way more advanced, then it's likely that there'll be no public clarity sooner, but actually things are moving privately and behind the scenes. So we have to understand, because when we finally do get clarity on this, if it is much more advanced than has been suggested in terms of the process of winner through to actually a formal acquisition, then what's been going on over the last few weeks is really advanced, really in depth. It's just a fact that both groups have to do that. If it turns out they just announced we picked someone and now it needs formal negotiation, now yeah. it needs further negotiation, now there's going to be a debate over price change or whatever, now we're looking to do this over the coming weeks, then you're right. It will be delays, it will be mind games. So we're going to have to wait and see on a little bit because I understand that both groups are really, really advanced. Both groups are not talking numbers. They're not negotiating. It's lawyers. Everyone's prepping themselves to sign and to move, not necessarily now to negotiate. So that's not a delay. That's just they're not announcing anything because they're ultimately getting everything in order first. Then they're going to go to the board yeah. and the Glazers, and then they're obviously going to move if they choose to move in any uh, direction. So I, I think that it's risky for people to bank on this week, formally speaking, providing full clarity on everything. But what I would say is that there's two things. There's what comes out formally. And to be honest with you, I'd still be surprised if we get anything formal from Manchester United or the groups over the course of the next few days. But we as journalists are obviously trying to establish what's going on and beat the formal announcement, if you like. And that's where we have to wait and see whether we can get anything definitive, even if there isn't a formal announcement this week. But we're going to have to wait and see. I don't ever want to sell a false dream. I don't ever want to simplify it to the point where I'm coming on air and I'm saying to fans, this team is going to win. That team is going to win. Because until you're 100% sure, it's completely irresponsible because look at what that did yesterday. So this is not now about, as a journalist, in my opinion anyway, being first. It's about being right. And even if I was 99.9% .9 sure that it was going to be one group or the other group, there's no way that I would put anything out until I'm 100% sure because I just think it's so big for the football club that you cannot even have 0.1% of doubt. Otherwise, for me anyway, it's just my perspective. It's irresponsible journalism. Well, it's not you. It's not just your perspective. It's exactly, as I said, why I sat there last night for half an hour watching everything go on. I'm like, do I report on this? Do I report on this? And it, uh, the only thing that tipped me over the edge was seeing the reaction in the market in the same way that I saw reactions in the market before. But it's, um, oh, have you ever seen anything like it? Yeah, it's, 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 it feels very on brand for Manchester United. It feels very on brand. I'm not the one I'm smiling. I've really done a while I'm smiling. This very, it feels very on brand for the Glazers. You can sort of understand. Uh, once this is all said and done, uh, you know how when the government, they were doing all their PPE contracts and everyone knew that there was some, it was just dodgy. I'm not saying that United are dodgy, by the way. Just let me get to the end of my analogy before I try. <laughs> That's what I'm saying about the Glazers. But everybody knew that something was going on that whole time. And now that it's a year, a year and a half, all the, the stories are properly coming out. I'm going to be interested to find out once this is hopefully all said and done and the Glazers are gone. And we find out more details about what's actually gone on through this process. Because I think you would have every right, as Sheikh Jassim or Jim Ratcliffe, to be pretty pissed off about coming this far into the process, this deep, and to then not get the club at the end of it. 
Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think all I would say, Manchester United fans see everything through a Manchester United prism. That's normal and you would expect nothing less. Yeah, but this is my, I counted it the other day, 18th takeover. And that's only really over the last five years, which tells you how football is moving. And I was across the Chelsea takeover from start to finish. Um, the Chelsea takeover was sanctions, a shock announcement of a sale, a super speed process. The government involved all manner of politics, a high volume of groups, mudslinging between the groups in the media, games. There was the eventual winners, Clear Lake Bowley, who obviously came in very quickly and have spent a lot of money. Rain Group were running that process as well. There was Sir Jim Ratcliffe after Clear Lake Bowley was in an exclusive yeah. period trying to hijack the deal and go outside of the process and publicly announce that he had the best part of four billion. And it was funny because at the time, a lot of people said, what on earth is he doing? Clear Lake Bowley in an exclusive period. How does he even think he stands a chance? And one theory at the time was he wants it out there in the market. He's got four billion because who knows? Manchester United might become on the market. And guess what? Manchester United's on the market. And Ratcliffe is now formally in the process. So every takeover has these twists. Every takeover has these changes of plot lines. And I've covered enough that I know when I can confidently say something and I know when I have to be a little bit more cautious. And this, again, is why I'm not prepared to back up any rumor or people trying to jump the gun for clicks and headlines. There will be in likelihood a conclusion, as you say, that is not just no sale. And when that is definitive from sources, I'm sure you'll see the mainstream media that whoever's watching follows and trusts report on that and add all of the detail. But again, I mean, they're both it's under NDA, but everyone's under NDAs, aren't they? So that's going to be blocking quite a lot of that funnel of information. Well, yes and no. I mean, the NDAs are over the process and the detail, and the groups have to naturally respect that, as does the seller. But uh, there will be nothing once something is agreed and Manchester United plan on announcing it publicly to stop that public announcement being reflected within the media as well. So actually, when we're talking about numbers, when we're talking about prices, when we're talking about all of these different aspects, then it's very difficult because, as you say, people are under NDA. We all go to our sources. We all do our best to compile the information accurately. But when you get to it just being announced, it will be the most public thing ever. There will be statements from all sides. With Chelsea, it was a joint statement. So that will be a lot easier to get the true picture. And the other thing, too, is that in hindsight, through the process of completion, some aspects will actually come out, will be declared. So we will learn certain things like the price in hindsight, and then we'll be able to kind of connect the dots and say, well, actually, yeah. the Qatar side were right all along, or the selling side were right all along. There'll be no hiding some aspects of this deal in hindsight if a deal gets done. So then when we've got a completely different narrative from each side, we'll be able to say, well, actually, the selling side were right all along and the pledged investment was actually part of it. Or we'll be able to say that the notion the pledged investment was part of Qatar's offer was all just a way of muddying them somehow in order to try and drive the price up further. And <laughs> what I would say is that the group perspective is there's no competitive tension because it's like apples and pears between the Ratcliffe bid and the Jassim bid. Yeah. And yet... Jassim has bid twice after the so-called final April the 28th deadline. So if you're a rain group running the sale, you have to say they've done their job because they've somehow been able to get two further bids from Qatar. And as a consequence, there has been competitive tension because if Qatar's position was correct, that they backed their bid, it was their highest offer, final offer was final offer, there would have been no need to make two other improved offers. The fact that there's been two other improved offers tells you that the competitive tension, even if it's denied, has to an extent worked. So yeah. hats off to those running the process because after final offers, they've got two more offers out of Qatar. And whichever side you're on, however you interpret anything, those extra bids show you that the 9-2 Foundation don't want to give up. Of course, it's a bit of a power play. Yep. coming in and improving their offer. But it also tells you that by keeping both groups in the race, by not yet to date having any kind of exclusivity, the tactic of driving up the Qatar number uh, has worked. And that's evident from the fact that after the so-called final offers deadline, which was always going to be fluid, but after that April the 28th deadline, 
two other bids have come in from Qatar, whereas to my knowledge, long... Ratcliffe hasn't changed anything. Is that how long ago it was? 28th of April was that like third mm. and final bid? Final in uh, inverted commas, final bid. <laughs> Six weeks. <laughs> Six weeks. Hey, look, what, when, when, when this is all said and done and we can look back and we can sit there, we can have like, I don't know, we can have a drink, we can, sit, we can talk through it all. It's going to make a really crap We book. need a drink. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'll make a really, really... Well, it's like one of those Goosebumps books. You remember the Goosebumps books where you you could you can make your own ending. You could like skip to page seventy four and go here. That's, that's kind of what it's like here. You're like which one? Which bid do you think is going to win? And it's um, I think I suppose the last 12, 12 hours are a lesson in what you said there, and a lesson it's a uh, I think it's an important lesson for any sort of aspiring journalist. Is it's it's not the most important thing to be first anymore. Uh, it, it might get you. It might pop your head of. It might pop your head up. A little bit earlier but then when you're wrong you gain nothing in fact you actually mm -hmm. kick yourself down a couple of notches uh yeah and, and also if qatar wins Sam, and which, which they may do i mean they're, they're at the know. table in your certain table if qatar win there might be people particularly on social media that say we told you so it was always the case but remember there were social media people telling you it was going to be done in february march april may so if you keep saying it's going to be done. It's going to be done. It's going to be done. Then eventually, if it's done, fine, you can celebrate and say, I always told you it was going to be done, but yeah. you were wrong in February. You were wrong in March. You were wrong in April. You were wrong in May. You were wrong yesterday evening. And if it happens, Qatar still don't know about it at the time we're recording. Now, that's not to say there's pessimism. Both sides, as I've said repeatedly, yeah. feel like they stand a very real chance. And why, again, because they're both being framed to get to the point of being ready to sign for when the Glazers finally make their decision. But again, if they win, even tomorrow, even as we're speaking, the people last night saying that they had won categorically wrong. are wrong. And I'm not, by the way, talking about journalists, because guess what? All the people that have covered this sale from start to finish that have been absolutely brilliant. I've got huge respect, for example, for Matt Lawton, Mike Keegan, Miguel Delaney, lots of people covering the sale from different angles with different perspectives, yep. have invested time and effort and energy. And you might not agree with them with everything that they say, but one thing's for sure. If they've covered it from start to finish, they're sure as hell not going to not cover the winner. And last night, none of them wrote anything or said anything on these reports because we were going to sources and caution was being urged. So even if it happens right now whilst I'm speaking, and it is Qatar, and there's lots of celebration from those that want Qatar, once again, the people last night saying it was done are wrong. Yeah. And they didn't know anything in advance because 92 Foundation last night didn't know anything in advance. So Qatar could win. Like, nobody's denying that. And Ineos remain in the race as well. But once again, we have to, as journalists, be 100% sure that it is a win. Not that it might be a win. Not that it could be a win. Otherwise, you're just jumping the gun. As I said, uh, I've always, I think that's probably why me and you got along so well. Uh, and why we talk why we talk so much. <laughs> we were, so knows how many hours we've clocked up talking about this. Yeah. But, I, but I'm... I'm Maybe the next one will be the one. I think I said that last time, but maybe the next one will be the one when we've when we've got that clarity. I won't use the word preferred bidder. We've got that clarity, and that's what we're just waiting for. And I think the um, the market, because I'm looking at the market again now, it's still hovering around about twenty two dollars. It's still ten percent up on yesterday, so it's not completely dipped back down. Uh, I'll be interested to kind of follow it and see how the trend continues to go. But as it stands, still there is no preferred bidder. Still. From the Qatari side of things, nothing is complete. And that was the sort of the suggestion yesterday. And that's why we had this conversation. And Ben, as I said, thank you so much, man, for giving us so much of your time here as a community. I think uh, everyone is constantly saying, get Ben on again, get Ben on again. They appreciate uh, your insight and, and your time. So thank you very much, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, look, hopefully we can bring you that clarity soon. I think it's what everybody wants. But yeah. like I've said repeatedly, I won't jump ahead and offer any clarity before I'm sure that the clarity is legit, which probably means a 12th show at some and point. Where, exactly. When you get that clarity, you'll be, oh, once I've got to FaceTime Sam immediately before I go anywhere else. That's exactly where you're going to go, Benny. <laughs>
<laughs> maybe, maybe not. We'll see. But look, thank you very much, Ben. Um, I'm sure we'll be back for number 12. If you did enjoy the video, drop a like on it. Make sure you follow Ben at Jacobs Ben on Twitter. Still not got your Twitter name back yet? No? No, I mean, there's Ben Jacobs. He's got one follower. I'm not changing now because the backwards brand <laughs> you, has just become my it. thing. Yeah. But there is a Ben Jacobs out there and he doesn't have a profile picture. He's never tweeted and he's got us? zero followers and followers one, I think. So it's very strange that he has the audacity since about 2008 to take the forwards way of saying my name. I'm gutted because well, when I first joined Twitter, I probably could have just taken Benjamin Jacobs. But... <laughs> Oh, well, Jacob's Jacob's ben. Ben. It'll stay at Jacob's, Jacob's ben. Ben. It suits you anyway. Right, we'll, leave exactly. it. we'll leave it at that. Anyway, thank you very much, Jacobs. <laughs> I'll see you soon. <laughs>